Continuing on in our series on the Champlain Towers condo collapse in the Miami town of Surfside, in today's video, we're going to show you the roof and the damage that was going on there and what they were doing to fix it and what the issues were that they found. Now, in one of our previous videos here, we showed you that excessive pooling of water on the roof of the Champlain Tower South condo sometime before it collapsed. And so what we're going to dive into today is look at the testing that was done and what sort of damage they found to the roof. And we will determine if this was somehow a stressor or a contributing factor in this condominium collapse here in Miami Beach, Florida. Okay, so the Palm Beach Post near us, as you can see, did this story on June 25th, which was the day after the collapse. And it says here, Surfside building official was on the roof 14 hours before the condo collapsed. And so he was giving an update at the city council meeting, and this is him right here. His name is Jim McGinnis. He was saying there was no inordinate amount of equipment or materials or anything on that roof that caught my building official's eye that would make it a alarming as to this place collapsing. Now I thought this was interesting here. So this shows what he was there to inspect. He said he was on the roof to inspect the work of replacing the roof anchors, which are where window cleaners attach their equipment. So this was part of that, that 40 year recertification plan that Morabito uh, Engineering was overseeing. So, so they were putting these new anchors in place on the roof to help window washers because they are required by code, but they were not on the building. Uh, presumably it wasn't required in 1981 one when the building was completed. Just 14 hours before, the town's building official, Jim McGinnis, was on the tower's roof. Seven's Kevin Ozebeck pressing him for answers. When you were on the roof the day before, were there any signs, anything that looked... None. No. Any idea yet what may have happened? I don't want to speculate at this time. Right now, it's under investigation. McGinnis also stressing he saw no warning signs at an emergency town commission meeting. There was no inordinate amount of equipment or materials or anything on the roof that caught my building official's eye that would make me alarming as to as to this place collapsing. So as part of the Champlain Towers 40-year recertification process, back in July 30th, 2020, they had a company called Roof Surveys Incorporated come in to do this roof moisture scan and condition analysis report for them because probably the roof was 15 to 20 years old. We don't know when they did it last. But down here in Florida, roofs last about 15 years, maybe 20 if you're lucky. But a lot of the times people think, well, it lasted, but it's really got problems. So let's take a look at the problems that they found. The construction makeup of the roof at the Champlain Tower South condominium there in Surfside, Florida. The roof system was a typical textbook coal tar pitch applied built up membrane type roof. So these use several membranes that are covered with an application of the mineral aggregate. And so this type of roof starts at the bottom here on the top of the building. This is the concrete roof slab deck. And then right on top of that, they put the poly iso insulation. Now these are these boards or panels of uh, thick insulation. They're rigid foam insulation, typically about I don't know, an inch or so. And then on top of that, you get your wood fiber type insulation boards. Sometimes they do it with glass fibers. And then above that, they have several layers of what we call the multi ply or the built up membranes and this is the layer where they're supposed to be trying to get that one slope of you know it would go at an angle like this down towards wherever the drain is that way whenever you have rainwater that can drain down into the drain and it doesn't just sit there on the roof but as you can tell by the videos that we showed you a couple of months ago it was more than obvious that even a year ago they had a problem with water pooling on top of the building it just didn't seem to be draining from the roof down to the drain and then on top of these membrane layers they have this mineral aggregate that's usually uh, buried in the tar once you have your whole roof now okay mother nature takes its toll on it it's going to spend the next 15 years trying to force water down in through these different layers and once the water starts piercing the layers it's game over for folks because the minute it gets down into the concrete slab here it will be stuck here where you'll have the same problem that they had down on the pool deck down below where the water sits under the membrane and it just destroys the concrete over time and causes spalling and cracking first divide the roof up into five different sections here and this right here in the middle is the mechanical house and then this is the stair house now you can tell by this overhead photo just how filthy the roof had gotten over the years and how much water had been settling down on here you can see it just all over it's almost pitch black 
They accomplished this survey of moisture here using a non-destructive radioisotopic moisture survey. And this will also act as a leak source detection as well. What they do is they use this little Troxler device that you see there. They stick it down on top of the roof and there are pictures of the actual roof on top of the Champlain Towers South building there. And so they put this gauge down there and the gauge performs these radioisotropic moisture readings. What happens here is when they put this gauge down here, it shoots a bunch of high-speed neutrons into the material below. And if it collides with any hydrogen, meaning H2O, the neutrons will come back at a slower rate. And it uses that measurement to determine just how much subsurface hydrogen and moisture is present right here at this location where they have the machine setting down there. These are likely spots where they found higher moisture. So this one says 20, and I think this one over here says 25. You had 30, and I think that one was 35 over here. So what they do here is they divide the roof up into 10 foot by 10 foot sections, and they go around the entire roof to take these readings and plot it on this chart. And so just taking a quick look at the overhead photo again on the roof, I wanted to just show you this is the shear wall right here. And then this whole section is the section of the building that collapsed. So when this part of the building over here collapsed, it sheared away from the shear wall, leaving this straight wall. And this mechanical house right here sits on top of the elevator shaft. So this is our elevator. This is the stairs, the staircase leading down, and it pops out down below on that little part of the pool deck, which is just outside of the, the fitness center. Remember, the fitness center on the first floor is right below here. And then this is that one planter outside Sarah Nair's apartment, outside 111. This is where I think that first column fell, column M11.1. So many of us think that this was the first column to fall. So just kind of putting everything in perspective for you as to what we're looking at. So what they do is they mark the roof off in sections of 10 square feet at a time and they go around and they take these meter readings and that's what you see these black numbers are all over the roof. They went around with that little meter and then the areas that are shaded blue and then darker blue are the areas where there was higher and then if it's like 30 and above it's a wet subsurface as you can tell by their legend right over here the moisture legend. So they basically went around and just plotted all over the place and all of these red dots these are where air conditioners were so they're all over the place and then if we look even closer we can find other things too like I want to see where the main drains were so you have to sort of zoom in here's one right there this is one main drain right there and here is another one over here and there's another one right over here upper central part of the screen and then right down here almost in the middle of the screen is another one right next to this 22 and then over here on roof area number two Here's another one here right next to number 16. And probably we'll find a few more over here. Here's one. Let's see if there's any other. This is one here next to the number 20. And I think that's pretty much it. So the fact that we see so many of these shaded blue areas here says to me that the water was starting to penetrate through all of the layers pretty much everywhere. And then you see all of these numbers and circles, these pink numbers and circles here. These are going to show you the photograph angles that they shot. They're going to show us some photos here in the report that they took on the roof. And these are basically showing the viewpoints of each one of those numbered photographs. So they're all over the place here looking at the major parts of the roof structure. So now what we can see here is here's how they decided where to take the core cuts from that they were going to measure because now you got to take it back to the lab to confirm. So you can see here core cut one over here in the lower right. They picked it from this dry area here from where it says 20 and all of the others were from wet areas. For example, here's core cut number two. And you can see they took it right from a reading of looks like 25. And then core cut three over here on the left was taken from a reading of 30. And core cut number four down on the lower left was taken from a reading of 35. These other three were taken from areas where they suspect great penetration of water and moisture underneath the membranes. And then probably left this one dry as a control or just to see, compare the other samples with the one that they think is going to be the dry one. I'm willing to bet when we look at their data, that core cut number four is going to be the worst. Okay, so here's the results of their four samples. Now remember, I told you here's cut one on the left, cut two, cut three, and cut four. And if you remember a few minutes ago, I mentioned that cut four was likely going to have the highest reading because it's a 35. 
and then cut three is at 30 right here and cut two was at 25 and cut one was at 20. So what they did was they took those core samples there. They took everything down to the concrete. They did not take any concrete with them. But here is that upper level there with the aggregate and the gravel and then the wood fiber layer and then the, uh, the ISO insulation. So if you remember that screen I showed you earlier, this is what they did. They took a core all the way down through all of this. Okay, so now looking back here at the screen again, um, what the lab did was they weigh the samples when they come in, then they put them in an oven at 240 degrees for a day to dry out the water, and then they determine what's the difference in weight. And that's how much moisture was in there. Here's the moisture loss. So now they're calculating the percent moisture by weight of those samples that were sent to them from the roof for all four cuts. And now if you look here at the cut number two, it was at 109.48%. And Cut number three, now this was on the, the insulation. That means that insulation was pretty much saturated there. And uh, in cut number three, you can see it was at 8%. Now, if you look down here what the Florida building code allows, as much as 5% moisture in the roof membrane and only 8% in the rigid board, the insulation. So this one had 109%. Core number three had 94% in there. And it had 137% here in cut number four. And then up here on cut number three, you can see that its gravel and membrane layer had 8% in there. So there was a significant amount of subsurface water in this roof. And probably because they had let the roof go too long before changing the roof. And then as the legend says here, all of these numbers in red represent areas that have high moisture. Now, is it high enough to have to repair the roof? Let's take a look. So they give you this other chart here where they took those five roof areas that I showed you, and here's the square footage of each area, and here's the area that they found wet. So remember all of those blue areas and the areas of higher moisture measurement, and they calculated what percent of those areas is wet. So roof area one was only 15%, almost 16%. Roof area two had 47%. That means one half of area two was wet. Here's area two. So one half of all of this area right here had subsurface moisture, meaning the roof membrane had degraded to the point that you had a whole bunch of water collected up underneath. Uh, roof area three was only 11.4%. Five percent. The stair house, you know, it's a small area, and same with the mechanical house, um, very small. So there was nothing there. Do you see the statement right here that says the amount of water affected roof materials exceeds the twenty-five percent threshold within area two? So let's take a look at this again. So area two says forty-seven percent of the area saturated with water. We have a rule here in Florida called the 25% rule. And it goes like this. This is my roof right here. And you can see I've divided it up into four quadrants, 25% each, right? And let's say I have some leaks right here and they all stay within 25% of the roof. I can patch these up with no problem. If suddenly I start having leaks all over the roof and now it's more than 25% of the roof, according to Florida building code, I have to replace the entire roof. I can't patch it. And I think they did this originally to make sure that everybody's roofs come up to code. They don't want to have me with an old roof with maybe some new patches and maybe the patches are up to modern code, but it's still patched on an old roof that wasn't done right. And this actually benefits many of us who have hurricane claims and, and benefited me as well. Well, several years ago when I had to have this whole roof replaced after Hurricane Wilma, and, and that is that it prevents the insurance companies from just giving you a $900 check and telling you to go away. Um, because, you know, you know, you've seen all of those commercials with Liberty Mutual and all of these other companies that they practically sound like they're the best Christians ever, and uh, they're your good friend, and they're going to do this and that for you, and they're going to bend over backwards for you. Well, when the rubber hits the road, folks, and you, and you have a claim to make, their first answer is going to be no. But luckily, if this law comes into effect here and really protects you when you have damage scattered all over the roof because then they are required to replace the entire roof under insurance claims. Here, um, this used to be back in like 2014 to 2017, it was in the chapter seven, but here in our building code, here it is in 1511.1.1. It says not more than 25% of the total roof area or roof section of any existing building or structure shall be repaired, replaced, or recovered in a 12 month period unless the entire existing roof system or roof section is replaced to conform to the requirements of this code. 
So this is what they've nicknamed in Florida as the 25% rule. Okay, so coming back to their statement, that's why he's saying here, the amount of the affected roof there exceeds the 25% threshold. So that means that right here on roof number two, this whole area has to be replaced. Now, why not the rest of the roof? The way the, the law states it is that these are all sectioned off. These are different roof sections because it's partitioned or it's broken off by a paraffin or in some other way it's just separate from the other roof sections so each one of these is its own independent roof section so only this area had that super high amount of moisture but what is still mind-boggling to me though is this folks i'm looking at this chart and i'm seeing you know what I'm seeing moisture penetration in a lot of these other areas. It's not more than 25%. But I'm thinking, hey, this is a good time to replace the entire roof. I don't know if they were replacing the entire roof or not. It didn't hard to tell whether they were replacing the entire roof or not. But we do have a clue in that. Now, I've owned several condos over the years, and I've been slapped with re-roofing assessments on four of my condos. And each time the assessment cost is between five and $6,000. That's about average for a commercial roof. So you would expect this one to be somewhere around $700,000 or so based on the 135 condos in this building. And then sure enough, when we look at the budget here for the 40 year certification project, we can see this line item B, bid package 2B, new roof membrane and OSHA suspension anchors subtotal. So this $850,000 is in that price range that you would expect a whole new re-roof to be in, not just a repair of one section of the roof. And then here you can see when they expand out the individual line items for Morabito's structural engineering uh, estimate. And so when they break it out here, you get one clue here. It says remove existing roof components, includes removal of the gravel, the total roof system in areas of excessive moisture. So does that only mean section two or does it mean all of those other areas where they found the blue spots? You know, I would have personally done the entire roof. And based on this cost, I think they were doing the entire roof at the time. So do I think that the roof had anything to do with the collapse? No, I don't at this time. I haven't seen any evidence that points us in that direction. I still believe, like many others do, that in like the witness accounts say that the pool deck fell first. And then I think one of the columns around here somewhere fell first, which started the whole house of cards coming down. So, but one thing is for sure, this building was facing an onslaught of water intrusion from all over, from the pool deck, from the roof, leaks inside the building leaks through windows and doors and here's more evidence of that onslaught of water because here you can see on june 25th there was already a news story about a lady saying that she was standing on the balcony saying this is not safe and she had warned her brother numerous times that the complex felt unsound due in part to frequent complaints about leaks and mold so this building was definitely under a major onslaught of water intrusion if you want to see more great analysis videos on the subject of the condo collapse, make sure you are subscribed with the alerts turned on. Make sure you come to the homepage here and check out our playlist on the engineering disasters and collapse construction fields. We have a lot of videos on this subject right here. Also, you can watch the playlist by clicking here on the upper left on the screen. Well, that's it for this week, folks. Thank you so much for joining us this time, and we'll see you on the next video.